Well, good evening. It's good to be here with you guys. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you've got a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, I invite you to open to the book of Luke, chapter 15. That's where we're going to be at today as we continue our study through the book of Luke. Uh, and as we get started, I got a, a question for you. Uh, and, and have you ever uh, misremembered a, a song lyric or a movie quote or something like that, only to realize that it was wildly different than what you actually thought it to be? And, and I'm sure you've been in that place before. And as I was thinking about this, I thought about uh, this, this moment. Um, I was uh, probably 16 or 17 years old with we some friends. Uh, I grew up here in Lake Havasu. And back in the day, it seemed like every Every single business that advertised had some sort of jingle, some sort of like musical melody to advertise their business. If you've been around Havasu for a while, you probably noticed that along the way as well. And, um, and I'm sure other towns are similar, but I just knew that about Havasu growing up. And I remember I was hanging out with some friends one day, and we we're just kind of talking, and we were kind of spitting some of these jingles out. We were teenagers, so we were probably mocking them relentlessly along the way. Um, but then at one point, as we're all just like sharing different ones that we knew, one of my friends shared the Havelina Cantina one. Um, and, and as he shared it, we all stopped and looked at him like, wait, what did you think it says? And, and I don't actually remember the exact way, uh, but there's two that I remember. It was one of these two. I don't remember which one is correct, and Google didn't help me because it didn't make it to the internet, apparently. But it was either Havelina Cantina, add some spice to your life, which I think is the correct version. Um, and I think my friend thought that it said Havelina Cantina, have the time of your life. Um, but in any case, we just laughed hysterically about this and didn't let him live it down for the next two or three months because we're like, I can't believe that you actually thought it said that. And so I'm on a little rabbit trail this week about the different kind of commonly misquoted song lyrics throughout time. And I wanted to share some with you until I realized that most of them weren't actually appropriate to share with you um, from stage. So you're going to have to just do that little journey on your own on the internet. But but it transcends every genre of music from Elton John to the Beatles to Sir Mix-a-Lot and Taylor Swift. It covers everything. Um, and and it, it shows that sometimes we hear, see, uh, process something, and we make up our mind of what that is, and then our opinion of it kind of locks in. And, and it's not till we're forced to take a step back and go, is that really what that means? Is that really what that song says that we're then confronted with the truth? And today, as we look at Luke chapter 15, we're going to see a passage of scripture that if you've been around church a while, you have heard for sure. Um, and and in my opinion, we all need to collectively take a step back and go, okay, what's this passage really wanting us to hear? Because it's really easy to just narrow in on one part of it. And, and not that that kind of aspect is incorrect, but I think we miss the broader scope of what's happening in this passage if we just narrow in on that one part that maybe we're prone to. So now that you're like, what is it? Let's take a look. So uh, Luke chapter 15, we're gonna start down in verse 11 and read that together uh, through the end of the chapter. Uh, and it says this. And he said that as Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. Essentially, give me my inheritance. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent them into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. 
For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called to the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your father, or or your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, and he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He said, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is now found. Now this is the, the passage of scripture that throughout the course of history has become known as the, pro, the, the parable of the prodigal son. And again, as I shared, if you've been around church for a while, you've heard sermons talk about the, the prodigal son, that son that left and wandered off and then came back. And, and not that any of those were incorrect, and I think there's a lot to, to learn on just focusing on his story and, and what that means for those of us who wander from God and come back. And, and maybe like me, you even heard some sermons about just the, the son that stayed behind and, and how his attitude can be instructive to us. But I think that both of those miss the big picture of what's happening here. And I, I'm gonna explain a little later why I think the father is actually the main character of this story. But what I wanna do is, actually compare and contrast how the sons behaved, their choices, their their attributes and behavior, and the father's choices and attributes and behavior, and kind of compare those two things. So what we're going to look at first is the failure of the sons. And it is plural on purpose. It's sons, because as, as easy it is to look at just the younger son and how messed up he was and all the bad things he did, I think they both experienced some significant failures. They had some places where they went off the rails and how they lived their life, uh, and we're going to see that along the way. But the first thing that we see from both of them is that they prioritized what they could get. They prioritized what they could get. A, a selfish, you know, self-serving outlook was present with both of them. Now, it's easiest to see this with the younger son because he's the one that went to dear old dad and said, hey, I don't care about you. I wish you were dead so I could get half of all the stuff that you worked hard all your life for. But since you're still here, can you give that to me anyways? Like this is, this is incredibly bold and brash of a request, something that I think if any of us actually got that request, we'd have a very different answer than the father did, but we'll get to that later. But, but he was focused on what he could get. He's like, half of this is gonna be mine. I want it so I can do what I want to do. But see, the younger son wasn't innocent here either. Because at the end of it, when, when, when uh, the, the older son comes into the picture and, and he's interacting with the father, he's worried about what he can get also. He's angry and indignant about, about the, the brother being back because he's like, but, but I did all this stuff for you. And he's probably thinking, great, the, my brother's back, so my inheritance is going to get split again. And even if he's not thinking that, he's listening to the party and going, great, my inheritance is paying for that party. I hope you enjoy that calf because I'm paying for it. He's worried about what he can get. And how quickly do we go and do the same exact thing in our life and look at situations based on what we can get out of it? Look at our relationships as one side and saying, hey, what can I get out of that? How is that going to benefit and help me? How often at work do we go, oh, I'm only gonna do that if it helps me get a promotion or get better hours or better pay? How often in relationships do we you know, help someone out only to turn around and say, hey, you owe me one so that we can get a return on investment of our energy or help that we offered them? We're so quick to say, hey, what's in it for me? How does this help me? How does this benefit me? And the call of Christianity is the call to go against our sinful desire towards selfishness. Jesus calls us to something radically different than what our heart is prone to want to do. See, in Philippians, it's describing the the nature and, and personality and tendencies of Jesus, and it calls us to do the same. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. 
It says, let us not only look to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. So today, are you focused on what you can get in situations, or are you looking at how you can bless and benefit others? Because I know that when we focus on blessing others, God makes sure that we're taken care of and we get what we need. But the sons prioritized what they could get. They focused on that. And the second thing that we see is that they kept score. Now, this is primarily with the older son who stayed behind, but, but did you notice the conversation when, when dad and that older son are talking, how he's rattling off the things? He's talking about what he did. He's telling up, hey, I stayed behind. I worked for you all these years. I did this, I did this, I did this. And essentially what you hear him saying is, dad, I'm the better son because I've done these things. In a, in a similar way, the younger son who left is kind of keeping score. He's like, I'm not worthy, and, and, I, and he's recounting all the things that he's done, but that's actually a, a good thing, as we'll see later on. But, but he kept score. He was comparing himself against others and trying to keep score and figure out where he landed on the scoreboard. And again, how quickly do we do that same thing? How quickly do we look around us and, and look at how other people are living, look at the things that they have done or haven't done, and go, oh, man, I don't have that in my past. I'm, I'm better at following Jesus than they are because of that. Or maybe we look around and look at the decisions people are making and go, oh, I'm, I'm a better parent than they are because I don't do those things. Which is a side note, how many of you had to eat the words, when I'm a parent, I'll never do that? Um, <laughs> Okay, it's not just me. Okay, good. It makes me feel a little better. I, I've, I've made the comment uh, quite a bit lately in talking to, to young married couples that I was a better parent before I had children than after because I knew so much better about parenting, but that's, a, that's another sermon right there. But how, how often do we rank ourselves and go, hey, I, I don't do all those things. I'm a better parent or grandparent. I'm a better spouse or friend or employee than those people are. Or even within the church, we look around and we go, well, I do more than they do. I volunteer more, I give more, I serve more, I show up more. God loves me more than them because of that. And that's a very dangerous place for us to get. In fact, as we continue through the book of Luke, later on in the, the book, we'll get to a section in chapter 18 where this very situation comes up. Jesus tells another parable and he tells a parable about a, a Pharisee, this religious leader, and a tax collector, kind of one of the worst. We could exchange that maybe with politician in our day. You got a, you got a pastor and a politician at church praying. It is essentially what Jesus tells as this parable. And, and in the parable, it says that the, 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 the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, for I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. And then Jesus says to the tax collector, prays and simply says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says that the tax collector is the one who receives mercy and grace from God because of his outlook there. See, our pride wants to take us to these places of thinking we're better than other people and wanting to establish some scoreboard in our head. But God calls us to live with humility and understanding that we need grace just like everybody else. But the final failure of the son is that they divided relationships. And again, the, the younger son that left, we see that most boldly that he just through this massive division into the relationship with his father when he asked for the inheritance, and then he leaves. And it's easy to, to skim over this because we have such this transient culture. We move for college and then this, and we get married and move here and move there. But you get the sense that it's not, that's not what happens here. Because he moves, it says, to a faraway land, to a, a faraway country, but there's no connection anymore. There's no, there's no contact, there's no email, obviously, there's no telegram, no courier pigeons. Whatever they did for contact, it didn't happen because the father says when he comes back, he was dead and is now alive. He left as if to say, I am dead, don't bother, I'm never contacting you again. He divided his family. 
And the, the older brother who stayed behind, he does the same thing. He, he throws this division up when, when there's a little bit of, of unity coming back. When the, the prodigal comes back, he goes, I'm not going into that party. If you pay attention, when he's talking to the dad, he says, this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours did this. He's saying, I don't even want to associate myself by saying that it's my brother. How often do we do the same thing we, with our family, with our friends, coworkers, business partners, romantic relationships, whatever it may be, something comes up and we, we create division. Over sometimes something little and something minuscule, we make it significant and we drive a wedge into those relationships and never reconcile them. Now, I'm not saying that it's bad to have those necessary endings and friendships. I'm not saying that every relationship has to continue forever. Sometimes the best thing to do is to part ways. But how often do we do that over stupid stuff? Over one comment, over a preference, over a feeling and emotions, and we unhealthily divide relationships. See, the sons here are giving us a great example of what our sin nature wants to do with our life. And maybe before we get too caught up doing exactly what I said a moment ago not to do with keeping score, we need to shift gears here and talk about the lessons of the father. Because I said my goal is to kind of compare the two of these characters in this parable, in this imaginary story that Jesus tells to prove a point. And and again, I've heard throughout my entire life, basically, uh, of being in church that that the prodigal son, this younger son who left and came back is the point of the story, but I don't think that's the case. I think that the father is the main character of the story for a couple of reasons. First, from a, a literary perspective, we see that the story follows the father. It's how the father responds to the ridiculous inheritance request, how the father responds to that son coming home, how the father responds to the older son's anger and judgment. It follows the father's process through that. But also, when you step back and look at the overall flow of chapter 15 of Luke, the chapter contains three parables, and they're all in the same category. Three parables about someone losing something. Last week, we looked at the first parable, the parable of the shepherd who loses the sheep and how he leaves the 99 to go find the one. And in that parable, it doesn't talk about the decisions that the sheep made that found him lost. It doesn't talk about how he was grazing and just you know daydreaming about stuff and looked up and everyone was gone. No, it talks about the shepherd going and finding the sheep. The focus is on the person who lost someone and how they responded. The second parable in the chapter, we kind of just skimmed over. It's a smaller parable, and, and it's about a woman who loses a silver coin. And it says that she focused her entire life then on finding that coin. She dropped everything to go find it. And when she did, there was celebration and rejoicing. Again, it wasn't what choices did the coin make to get itself lost, but what did the woman do when she realized something was missing? And so we get to the third parable in this chapter about this father who lost one of his sons for a season, and I think the focus needs to be what was the action of the father because I think that what Jesus is wanting to do here is teach us about our heavenly father. I think he's wanting to use the father in this story to teach us what are the attributes and characteristics of our heavenly father and what's that do to help us follow him. So let's look at some of the the lessons of the father. The first one is that he lived with generous grace. There's grace here, but there's a generous amount of grace. To the younger son, there is an incredible amount of grace that's given upon that request. Again, if, if any of us, I think, were confronted with one of our kids coming and saying, hey, I see that you're still alive, and that's a problem for me because I want your inheritance we would probably not say, okay, let's go to the bank and do some math and and figure that out. We'd probably tell them somewhere else to go rather than the bank. (laughs) But there's grace that's there. That says, hey, this is is unreasonable, but I'm gonna do it anyways. When he returns and and he falls before his father and says, I've sinned before heaven and you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, he doesn't go, no, you're not. 
so he can go out there and start feeding some pigs. There's no lecture on his life choices. There's no I told you so moment. There's celebration and grace that's offered. And the father interacts with the older son out back outside the party. He's not, he's not giving him an ultimatum saying you get in there or else. He's simply saying, hey, I, I love you too. You've, you've always been with me. Everything that I have is yours, but there's reason to celebrate here. And see, when we look at this as a teaching opportunity about our Heavenly Father, we see that this is exponentially true, that our Heavenly Father lives with generous grace towards us, that there is limitless grace available in Jesus for those of us who, who maybe lived like one of these sons. Maybe we were a wanderer sinning boldly against the creator of the universe taking all the things that God has given us, our talents, our possessions, our relationships, our skills, and wasting them on reckless living just like the prodigal son. There is grace available in Jesus for us. Or maybe we're like the, the son out back. Maybe we're the religious people who are looking down our noses at the, at the people who have come to God and we're thinking, I've, I haven't done any of those things. God, I've been with you the whole time. What are these people doing here? There's grace available there for us and an invitation to change our outlook as well. And see, all throughout scripture you see this. You see, Romans explains how while we were still sinning, Christ died for us, Romans says. Ephesians 2 says it's the grace of God, not our hard work, not our good works that we're saved, but the grace of God. It says it is a free gift John 1, 16, as it's talking about Jesus coming to earth, says that when we follow him, we find grace upon grace for our life. There is limitless grace there in Jesus. But it takes a relationship. It takes us saying, hey, I want to follow you, God. I want to connect with you. But the, the thing that we under, need to understand is that the Father's heart towards us, just like the one in the parable here, is one of generous grace, no matter where we find ourselves. Second lesson of the Father is that he forgives the past. And maybe this seems a little redundant uh, with, the, with the grace element here, but, but I want to contrast this with the son's tendency to keep score. Because it would have been very easy for the father to come to that younger son when he came back and start listing off all the things that he did wrong. It would have been so easy for him to say, well, you did this, so here's your consequence. Here's this, and here's what you need to do because of it. Here's how you need to pay it back. Here's the restitution you need to do. All the things, and yet he offers forgiveness and leaves it in the past. And that's what God does for us. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's taken away, it's cleaned, we're wiped clean. Psalm 103, 12 says that when we follow God, he takes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. See, God doesn't look at us and say, hey, here's your roster of sins. Here's all the failures in our life, and I'm going to hold that over your head forever. But he forgives the past and takes that away. And this is important because for those of us that resonate maybe with that, that prodigal, that younger son who left and squandered everything on reckless living, sometimes we connect our life story, our identity, our, our meaning and value to our failures and mistakes. And what we need to understand is if we follow Jesus and have a relationship with him, if we say, I believe that you're the son of God and savior of the world and I want to follow you with my life, then our identity is son or daughter of the living God. It's not the identity of addict and failure or anything like that, but the identity from our heavenly father. And for those of us more from a religious background, more morally focused for the, the scope of our life, we also need to understand that our identity isn't in our good works. It's not in our ability to be superior in some way to others, but it's in Christ that we find our identity. And understanding that, that God forgives the past when we follow him. The last thing that we see from the Father is that he prioritized restoration. And this is the cool one. 
Because as we look at what he did and how he responded to this situation, the brothers divided the family, they divided relationships, and as soon as he has the ability, the father gets to work on restoration. The younger son comes home, and instead of giving it some time to figure it out, immediately a, a, a nice robe goes on, shoes go on, a family ring, a signet ring gets put on it, a party is thrown and you don't throw a party for just two people. So they're inviting people. They're saying, we're bringing together. There's, there's unity and connectedness happening here. With the older son complaining and groveling out back, he invites him in. He says, let's be restored. Let's come back in. There's reason to celebrate. And if you catch the father, throws the verbiage back at him because the son goes, this son of yours did this. And the father goes, your brother was once dead and now is alive. He's prioritizing restoration, redemption, reconciliation, whatever other R word you wanna throw in here that that is a synonym there. And see, the truth is that when we follow God, that same thing happens. When we say, hey God, I have reached the end of myself. I want to give everything over to you. I am all in following you. He immediately gets to work on restoring the things that we've broken because of sin. All throughout scripture, you see this take place of people who have broken their life and God redeemed and restored them. And the same is happening today. Our, our staff and our volunteer teams are living proof of this. Our, our staff, uh, as well as our volunteer teams, are full of people that had failures from drugs to alcohol, infidelity, pornography, addiction, and theft. And all the ways that they broke and damaged their life, God got to work redeeming and restoring their health, their family, their marriages, their friendships, their character, their influence. All these people have experienced restoration and redemption because of God's work in their life. Now, it doesn't mean God is some magic genie. We just rub the bottle and our wishes come true. Because there might be some areas where we go, man, I, I want this to take place but it's not going to happen as a consequence to my sin. But what I do know is that when we follow God, he gets to work redeeming and restoring all the things that we've broken with our sin. Because that's his priority. It's his priority first to reconcile us to himself, for us to to become in relationship to God. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in, in him we might become the righteousness of God. When we say, God, I want to follow you, he restores our relationship to him and then starts working on restoring the things in our life. So today as we look at this passage, I want to invite you to look maybe at your own life. What are some, some ways maybe that you've misunderstood who God is along the way? Where are some places where you've picked up that this was a character or an attribute of God that maybe wasn't based on this parable? Maybe you picked up somewhere along the way that God is angry and vindictive against you because of sin, that he's waiting up there with his lightning bolt just trying to find the right time to throw it. Or maybe you picked up along the way that, that you have to be good enough to follow him. You have to get your life together in order to, to come to him and follow him. And instead, you've missed out that his heart is one of grace and forgiveness and restoration, that wherever we're at, we can follow him. And that that's the only way we find the purpose and meaning that we're looking for in our life. So today, where are you at in this story? I pray that you would take a step towards God with your life and that as you do that, you would see the the glorious celebration of grace that happens and that it would change your life forever as you follow God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that that you are good, that even when we are not, even when we have failed and wandered from you, even when we've stood on the sidelines thinking our morality was good enough, God, you met us with grace. And I pray today that you would help us to, to see all the ways that we've misunderstood you, all the ways we've misunderstood what it means to actually be a follower of Christ. And God, all the ways that we have have undermined the life that you've called us to. And God, I pray that you would help us to not live like 
these two sons in the parable here. Help us to, to step away from, from selfishness, to step away from comparison and keeping score, to step away from dividing and destroying relationships, and instead help us to live like your son Jesus, with grace and forgiveness and redemption as the focuses of our life. But God, we need your help to do that. We need your help to restore what we've broken because that's something only you can do. So God, help us to, to lean into you and your relationship. Help us to, to trust you in this process. And I pray that you would give us the courage to do that each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.